it is my very great pleasure to introduce as our preacher this afternoon my friend and fellow Presbyterian, the Dr. Margaret, the Reverend Dr. Margaret Amer. I'm not done yet. <laughs> she is professor of New Testament at Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary, recently promoted to full professor. <laughs> Dr. Amer studied at Harvard University and Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York. Her research has focused on the, gospel, on, on the epistle of James, the Gospel of James, okay, the Epistle of James, on which she has published two monographs. She is also an editor of the Fortress Commentary on the Bible. Following the teaching of James, Dr. Amer takes her faith well beyond her desk. She is a true doctor of the church, in demand as a teacher and preacher. She is also a musician, a daughter, a wife, and, I've met him, a justifiably adoring mother of Gabriel, age four. It is a real pleasure to welcome Dr. Amer to this pulpit. Many thanks, Reverend Dr. Gaventa. <laughs> <laughs> Sisters and brothers, before I begin, um, I just want to say a word of thanks to the organizers of this conference for having a time when I don't have class. <laughs> um, I know it's there. And um, also for thinking it not robbery to invite a Presbyterian up to Baptist land. <laughs> I bring you greetings from your sister seminaries down in Austin, Texas, the Austin Presbyterian Theological Sem Seminary of which I am recently or uh, ordained promoted as professor, and I will be the first woman of color to hold that title in the history of the seminary. And without being too presumptuous, I also bring you greetings from our sister seminary next door to us and our rivals in football, the Seminary of the Southwest. The Episcopalians also bring you greetings. As we gather together around the word one more time, and I'm going to talk to you later about making me follow a homiletics professor. As we gather around the word one more time, let us come to God in prayer. Christ in the eyes of all who see me. Christ in the ears that hear my voice. Christ in the heart of all who know me, O oh, Christ, surround me, O oh, Christ, surround me. Amen. The passage is from the Acts of the Apostles, the 12th chapter. This is my rough translation. And when Herod was about to lead him, that is Peter, out, that is out of the prison, in that night, while Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, having been bound with two chains, guards were keeping watch before the door of the prison, and look, a messenger of God appeared, and light illuminated the room, and striking Peter's side, he raised him and said, get up in haste. And the chains fell off his hands. And the messenger said to him, gird yourself and fasten your sandals. He did thus. And he said to him, wrap around your outer garment and follow me. And going out, he followed. And he did not know that this was truly happening because of the angel. But he supposed that he was having a vision. And after they went through the first guard and the second, they went to the iron gate that leads into the city which opened to them automatically, and going out, they went down one narrow street, and immediately the messenger went from him. And Peter, coming to himself, said, 
Now I truly know that the Lord sent forth his messenger and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all of the expectation of the people of Judea. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mariam, the mother of Yohanan, who was called Marcus, where there were many gathered together and praying. And when he knocked at the door of the vestibule, a slave girl named Rhoda came out to answer. And when she recognized the voice of Peter, out of her joy, she did not open the gate. But running in, she announced that Peter was standing before the gate. And those with her said, you have lost your mind. And she insisted that it was thus. They said, it is his messenger. But Peter kept knocking. And when they opened, they saw him. And they were astonished. And motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he related how the Lord led him out of the prison. And he said, tell Jacobus and his brother these things. And after going out, he left for another place. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Peter was in prison. Not simply in prison, mind you. Peter was chained twice, sleeping between two guards, behind a door guarded by soldiers in a prison cell, awaiting a summons to his certain execution by Herod Agrippa, the grandson of the Herod who tried to kill baby Jesus, and the nephew of the Herod who conspired with Pilate for the adult Jesus' death. Peter was in prison, and as good as dead. So the community of faith had gathered. The community of faith was praying. The community of faith was walking in as much hope as they could muster. But the truth was this. Stephen, the great preacher and the deacon of the church, was dead. James, the son of Zebedee, the son of thunder, was dead. And Peter was as good as dead. Peter was in prison. Everybody knows this. Everyone knows but Rhoda. Rhoda has heard Peter's knock. Rhoda has heard Peter's voice. Rhoda knows what no one else knows. Peter is free. But no one listens because no one believes her. Some of you might even be wondering this afternoon, who is Rhoda? To begin, sisters and brothers, Rhoda is an enslaved girl. When we miss that point, we miss one of the bravest little apostles in Luke's long narrative. To understand what it means that Rhoda is an enslaved girl, we must go back in time, back even before our own shameful reliance on human chattel slavery and the exploitation of people without documents. We must go back in time to the first century CE, and there we must put ourselves in the minds of first century people. Yes, even first century Christians. <laughs> Only then can we begin to understand the kind of fortitude it took for Rhoda to speak the gospel truth nevertheless. First of all, to say Rhoda is an enslaved girl is to say that Rhoda is at the very bottom of her society. Slaves in the first century, as in the United States, were considered nothing greater than objects, human-footed objects, as the Greeks call them. Rhoda is enslaved. And further, she is an enslaved female. This drops her further down the social ladder. After all, she's not even a man. 
<laughs> but Luke goes further. Luke describes her as a paideske, an enslaved female child. Rhoda is the person at the very bottom of the first century social ladder. She is property, property without power, property without gender privilege, property without the privilege of age. She's just that slave girl whose job it is to mind the door. Her job is to sit where she is told to sit. Her job is to do what she is told to do. Her job is to take orders and follow them unquestioningly, obediently, just as a child, a woman, a slave, a piece of human property should. Now, it is true that she is a slave within a Christian household, but <coughs> we know that, just as in the United States, Christian households in the first and second and third and fourth and so on centuries maintained and defended, hear me, defended theologically chattel slavery, supported unquestioned obedience, even interpreted unjust treatment as the equivalent of Christ's suffering. Those are some of those C minus Pauline students that Bev was referring to earlier. <laughs> but this girl child in slavery hears Peter's voice and knows it. And even when they will not believe it, nevertheless, this enslaved girl declares good news to God's people. This, sisters and brothers, this nevertheless makes this girl child in slavery one of the most courageous characters in Acts of the Apostles. Why courageous? You must understand that simply because of Rhoda's status, her status as a juvenile human-footed property, simply because of this, first century people, even first century Christians, would assume that she was a liar. Among first century people, this was common knowledge. Indeed, it was just plain common sense. Slaves were so routinely expected to be liars that under Roman law, slaves could not give testimony unless they had first been tortured. For if they were not tortured, it was just assumed that they would lie. But surely, you might object, surely the Christian community did not believe that slaves were liars, did they? How else does this story make sense? Rhoda receives what must be considered the gentlest of rebukes. You have lost your mind. But underlying this rebuke is the insistence that this girl child in slavery, this piece of property, this member of the least of these must be telling a lie. She cannot have any good news to tell us. Nevertheless, Rhoda insists on her good news, the good news that Peter is standing just outside. Nevertheless, Rhoda refuses to be silenced even when all believe her to be out of her mind, a crazy, lying slave. And to be quite clear, there is no little danger. Not only could a slave girl be tortured for giving testimony, every slave who did not immediately do what her mistress required could face physical punishment for disobedience. First century slave owners were not above the use of the whip, brands, and other implements of torture. You do know, don't you, that the very cross of Jesus' own death was a form of slave execution, an ancient form of the southern lynching tree. This, friends, is what Paul means when he says that Christ Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, and became obedient to death on a cross. This is not flowery theological language. This is the ultimate abasement, the debasement of the one in the form of God to become one in the form of Rhoda, to become human-footed property, less than a human, worth not much more than crossbate. Rhoda is a slave, 
a female slave, a girl slave. She knows what can happen if, despite direct orders to be silent, she insists on speaking. Even at her young age, she probably bears the bruises to prove it. She knows what can happen if a slave does not completely and fully conform to the will of her master. She has no doubt seen it with her own eyes. Nevertheless, door-keeping Rhoda, enslaved girl Rhoda, that human-footed thing of a nobody, goes into the community. Nevertheless, she insists that Peter is at the door. Nevertheless, she will not be silent even at the risk of her own body, her own safety. Friends, as we conclude this conference, I must ask you, what will it take for us to act like Rhoda? What will it take for us to announce good news when all around us see us as property and assume that we are liars to our core and out of our mind? What does it take to speak and refuse to be silenced with even your comfort, your safety, your life on the line? What does it take to act like Rhoda nevertheless? Rhoda, this enslaved girl child of Luke's narrative, Rhoda demonstrates that to act like apostles, we must practice fortitude. To be one call to truth-telling, to preaching and teaching and declaring liberation, to be a nevertheless female preacher, this takes fortitude. That habitual and firm disposition to do the right thing, the right thing, the good thing, the true thing, regardless of the risk, regardless of the cost. Now, Peter, of course, embodies fortitude in the prison cell of Herod's making. It's easy to see that, but do we notice the way in which Rhoda embodies fortitude? She who is imprisoned by chattel slavery practiced by Christians on Christians within the Christian assembly. Well, my friends, when the rest of the community insists you are nothing, but a human-footed thing, a girl child, a piece of property, someone whose presence and person are of no value to the rest of the community except as another machine to keep the grinding wheels of slaveocracy turning. It takes fortitude to speak out, nevertheless, to insist that one has a voice that must be heard. And when the rest of the community insists that you are ontologically a liar, because of your place in the social stratum, because of your class, because you are female, because no one like you could possibly tell the truth or be the bearer of divine revelation, it takes fortitude to insist that you are not crazy nevertheless. And when the consequences, and when the consequences of bearing witness to truth may be pain, torture, imprisonment, and death, it takes fortitude to bear witness, nevertheless, to bear witness to the truth of God's liberating, empire-defying, enslaved girl empowering and breaking into this God-beloved world. Some of you know, or have now all of you know, that my denomination is the Presbyterian Church USA. And every two years, we gather for our General Assembly, our major biennial legislative meeting. We make lots of decisions, out loud, in public, live streamed for the whole world to see. Now, most Presbyterians are not and never have been enslaved. In indeed, to be candid, some of us defended that hideous institution. At the same time, <laughs> We are not called the frozen chosen for nothing. <laughs> Many of us do not like conflict. Many of us do not like to raise our voices in public. This is why I so appreciated the reflections of blogger Carol Ferguson as she observed our general assembly. Ferguson described the courage she noticed on the floor of the assembly as risk averse, conflict avoidant Presbyterians person after person, stepped up to the microphone to address the business on the floor. 
she noted those persons who were nervous, whose voices cracked, whose hands shook. She noticed those whose responses were not perfectly polished. And this is what she wrote in her blog. The gospel does not allow us to crawl into holes, to avoid conflicts, or to stay home and close the blinds. The gospel compels us to speak whenever and however we can so that God's good news of bread for the hungry and healing for the wounded and peace for the abused can be made known. The gospel, my friends, compels us to speak nevertheless. This is easier for us when we are free and not enslaved. This is easier for us when we are seen as whole people made in God's image, regardless of our gender or age or status in the community or any other human-defined marker of our worth. This is easier for us when we face no real danger of physical harm, no real danger of torture and death. And yet, the truth is, my friends, we're called upon to speak the truth, to confess the faith, to tell the world what we believe, we often lack the fortitude. That great nevertheless that the slave girl Rhoda embodied in the face of laughter and ridicule, possible dismissal and likely physical punishment. But we have help. We have help from the God whom Martin Luther named the mighty fortress of heaven and earth, the God who emboldens us, although this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us. Nevertheless, and we have help also from the community of saints, from all the unnamed Rodas who were slaves after the Rhoda in today's text, slaves also within the Christian community, even despite the commands of Jesus Christ to do unto others as you would have them do unto you, we have help from this community of saints, these Rhodas, in the legacy of the stories of their fortitude, their nevertheless. We have help from them in the legacy of their songs, the sorrow songs, the spirituals, the oral witness to a living faith, even in the face of unassailable odds, a nevertheless kind of faith. And even though they too were counted as human property, nevertheless they gathered in prayer, in hush harbors, daring to sing the sorrow songs, the spirituals that bore witness to the justice of God. Even though they too were considered liars and cheats, shiftless and worthless, nevertheless they built churches and sang to each other about chariots and crucifixion, about deliverance and Canaan, and even though they too were always, always in danger of terrible punishment, even death for daring to gather, daring to worship, daring to claim their place among the whole people of God, nevertheless, they found the fortitude to sing to us a freedom of overcoming one day. And someone, perhaps remembering the Jesus of Revelation to John, or perhaps calling to mind the slave girl Rhoda in some unknown hush holler, one night found the fortitude to sing, Samba is knocking at your door. And as if she had not been heard, she repeated a little higher this time. Somebody's knocking at your door. And taking the full courage of her conviction, this unknown Rhoda, ignoring the danger of singing aloud, nevertheless, found the fortitude she sought, pulled herself up to her full height, and sang out, Oh, sinner, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Who is knocking at your door? What does it take? What does it take to embody the nevertheless faith of Rhoda? Friends, it takes fortitude. 
ovarian fortitude. Gestational fortitude. The fortitude to speak, to speak the truth, to speak the good news of God to this God-beloved world, nevertheless. We must, my sisters and also my brothers, we must claim the fortitude to say what we know to be true regardless of the risk, regardless of the cost. Nevertheless, for speaking the truth brings the good news to voice, even if no one wants to hear it. Speaking the truth reminds the community hunkered down and afraid that there is still a God in heaven and earth who is sovereign over this God-beloved world. Speaking the truth, even if you think you have no more power and status than an enslaved first-century girl child named Rhoda, speaking that truth sets people free. Tonight, as you leave this rich feast of a conference, be guided by an enslaved girl child. Indeed, may she haunt you. And when she does, stand with Rhoda, with fortitude, on the convictions that God has planted in your soul and revealed to your heart. Nevertheless, stand with fortitude, preaching the promises of Christ that have saved and continue to challenge us. Nevertheless, stand with fortitude, telling the truth of a God that sets Peter and all women and men free, regardless of the risk, regardless of the cost. Nevertheless, 